They call it the supercar you can drive every day. And today I'm gonna to tell you what it's like to drive every day. After ripping out the motor, the interior, getting it painted, and generally spending way too much time and money obsessing over this car, I'm gonna make an entire video about everything I know about the Acura NSX. If you're looking to buy one, what to look out for, and generally what it's just like to live with every day as my only car. Starting with the good stuff, the NSX is about as practical as a sports car gets. There's a large trunk that can fit plenty of things. Inside the cabin, the seats are nice and comfortable. The controls, the e-brake, the shifter, everything is right where you'd expect it. The clutch is nice and light, so even in mild traffic, you're not going to have one leg that's noticeably larger than the others. It also has electric seats, which for being a 91 model, or even any car from the 90s is, is quite impressive. This was a thing back in the day. If you had electric seats, you were cool. And if you were even cooler and very wealthy at the time, you could even get an NSX phone that's built into the center console here so you could call up people in your car because this is before cell phones. Which, by the way, if anyone has one of those, I'm willing to buy it. I want one. They're freaking awesome. Although, annoyingly, it does not have cup holders. There's really no place for it. Oh. Oh, there you go. The front lip will be scraped on just about anything, so don't buy a really nice one or a carbon fiber one. If you're used to driving lowered cars, then it's really no different. However, that is something to note. Because the NSX is so low to the ground and because the front bumper sticks out quite a ways, even if you take driveways at a certain angle, there's a chance that you can scrape your lip. Sometimes I didn't like even taking my NSX to certain places if I hadn't been there, just out of fear of this. Now driving one of these on the road is actually quite the pleasant experience. Despite being older and lower to the ground, the suspension's nice and compliant, these seats are really comfortable, so it doesn't beat you up when you're just trying to get to work. And despite the more aggressive exhaust system I've installed on the car, it's actually pretty quiet here in the cabin you can easily listen to music and have a conversation. Now it's not new car quiet, but it's quiet enough that it doesn't give you a headache after about an hour of driving. It also has one of the best transmissions I've ever driven in a car ever. It downshifts incredibly smooth, but every time you shift, it's an experience. It clicks right into gear. And it feels amazing doing it. And that's kind of the appeal of driving one of these cars is that, well, quite frankly, it's old. It's very analog. The steering is directly connected to the road, so you feel every bit of what the front tires are doing. If you're losing grip into a corner or if you have more grip to be gained, then you could just feel exactly what they're doing. Same thing with the shifter, directly connected to the transmission. When you pull a gear, it slots right in and then the tachometer and stuff, they're all analog. It's all, there's no screens in front of you that distract you from driving the car. It's a completely different experience than driving most modern cars. And I've driven a lot of modern cars that handle incredibly well, like a Camaro 1LE or a Subaru STI. And the Camaro handles great, but it's a bit numb. The steering's all electric. And so when you go into a corner, you kind of don't know what's going on, and it feels more like a racing simulator. Same thing with the transmission. When you pull a gear, it kind of feels like you're pulling gear on one of those Xbox simulators steering wheels you'd buy at GameStop. And the STI is kind of nice, but after about 20 minutes, you kind of just get the impression that you're in an economy car with really stiff suspension, and then your back hurts. And I'm 20, my back should not hurt getting out of any car. I think that's why I like driving the NSX so much is that even after two years of commuting in it and driving it everywhere, I'm not bored of it. It gets you where you want to go and it doesn't beat you up for it like if you were driving a race car. But when you do want to do race car things and go canyon carving and have fun just in general, then it does those and you have a blast. It can keep up with just about any car on a course and you'll have fun the entire time. You'll bang off the tachometer at 8,000 RPM and then drive home. You can't say that about many cars, even modern cars. Like if you bought 
even a more modern Porsche. Porsche is the best example of this. You can buy a modern Porsche and they're fantastic, but if you redlined it every day, you probably wouldn't want to also count on it to get you to work. But this is a Honda, so you can. However, the reason anyone would want to drive a car like this every day is the way it drives. And for that, you really do have to find some back roads. And that's really where a car like this is most enjoyable, when you can actually push it into a corner and rev out the motor and have fun with it without having to worry about other people on the road and traffic and things like that. However, my car wasn't always in very good condition. Heck, when I got it, one of these mirrors was held on with duct tape. The ABS was shot, the brakes were completely destroyed, the tires were completely bald, the paint had a scratch on pretty much every single panel, especially the front bumper where it was messed up. This was completely faded away and didn't really have any paint on it. The engine was pouring oil and had a leak just about everywhere there could be. The clutch was worn. And the car made a funny noise when you went over a right hand turn. Still don't know what it is to this day, but it's not there anymore, so. And the interior wasn't much better. These seats were all ripped up. The stereo didn't work. The climate controls didn't work. The AC compressor was shot too. The interior door panel wasn't even on this car and the thing was just in disarray. However, because of all of this, I had gotten one of my dream cars for less than you'd pay for a lightly used Honda Civic. Now I just had to fix it. Luckily, I was able to save quite a bit of money by actually working on the car myself. Despite being mid-engine in a supercar, it's really easy to work on. Well, except for the CV joints. Those, those suck. Those are horrible. And it's pretty low to the ground. With my dad's help, we were able to drop the motor out of this thing and replace the clutch, the timing belt, the water pump, all the engine mounts, and the engine seals that had been leaking oil all over the place. It's a pretty easy endeavor actually, and luckily everything's aluminum so there's no rust anywhere. You can take off any bolt and it's gonna come out without a, without a fuss. I would recommend putting a little anti-seize as they go back in just because it helps you out in the future, but it was so easy. I think anyone who's ever worked on an older Civic can work on this thing and not have a single problem. The instructions and the forums for these cars are extremely detailed. Despite there not being very many of them, the information on these cars is very vast. The only real problem though, is because it's aluminum, there's a tendency for aluminum to strip really easy. So you just gotta make sure when you torque bolts, you torque them to factory spec. And you do have to have a lift if you're doing anything major, like a clutch change or messing with the engine, because you have to get the car high enough off the ground to be able to get everything out from under it, like the transmission, to work on it, which you can't do on jack stands. So. If you know a mechanic, slip them some beer money and you'll save a lot. Common issues on NSXs include the ABS pump. It's prone to clogging up with uh, particulates that can get in the ABS fluid or the brake fluid or the rubber seals deteriorating and clogging up little orifices. The early models never had that great of ABS systems. It's very, very new in cars at that time and they seem to cause more issues than they're worth. You'll be driving down the road and you'll hear like this pump start squealing and yelling at you. You could rebuild it for a couple hundred bucks. I decided not to invest the time or care and just deleted it with a simple kit. You can also swap to a later model NSX or an S2000 ABS pump, but you can easily spend three or $4,000 doing that. And for me personally, I was comfortable enough driving without ABS that it doesn't bother me one bit. I don't think the early ABS systems were good enough to even warrant having them in the car. So I just got rid of mine. AC compressors. AC seems to be a big issue on early models from I believe 91 to 93 years. Most of the times it's a simple AC compressor. However, the condenser, which is in the dash, if that goes out, you're easily looking at spending three to five grand if you don't do it yourself because you have to pull out the entire dash, which actually takes more hours to do, according to most people, than an engine drop. It's a horrible procedure and you don't want to go down that route. So if you're buying an NSX and the AC's messed up, I would heavily invest some time into making sure that it's just a compressor or it's just a filter that's easy to change or commonly also is the control unit in the dash. Those are super easy to swap and a very common issue as those little transistors in them kind of bleed out over time and mess with the board inside of them. 
he sent them out to a company on eBay. I think they did mine for 150 bucks and they were able to polish it up, put some new transistors in there. And I've been blowing cold AC ever since, but that can get very expensive. So definitely look into that. One of the most infamous problems that ever plagued the NSX was the snap ring issue, much like the IMS issue on the Porsches. It's vastly overstated. Snap ring is an issue where there is a grooved part of the transmission where a snap ring goes over it and due to machining tolerance error, that snap ring can pop out. And when you're driving down the road, your transmission will pop out of gear or potentially just explode. That was only on early model NSXs and it's only in a certain range. You can check your VIN number. Even if I was looking at buying an NSX today and it was in the snap ring range, if it's over maybe 40 to 50,000 miles, I wouldn't even consider it a problem. It would have exploded by now. And if it had exploded, like this one actually did back in the early 90s, Acura just gave the owner a brand new transmission and off he went. They're really not a problem anymore if it's over that miles. If it's been driven, it's, it's not an issue even if it falls in that range. I don't think snap ring is anything to deter someone from buying an NSX. Excessive tire wear. This was an interesting one. When the NSX first came out, the camber on the rear was so far out that if you drove from San Francisco to LA, you could wear out an entire set of rear tires. Honda fixed this by adjusting the camber inwards a little and making it a little bit more flat in the back so that way that didn't happen. That's all that ever was. If you go to the track, Acura still recommends that they camber out your rear tires just because it'll give you a lot more grip in the turns. All the weight's back there and so when you go into a corner it's really going to push the momentum of that car and you can really take advantage of camber as you go into a corner. More on that in the next episode when I talk about suspension. I'm going to do a very advanced breakdown on the wishbones and different coilovers you can get for these cars to make them handle absolutely fantastic. But the tire wear is really just an issue with alignment. Common issue with early NSXs is their long windows. The regulators always seem to fail on them and you'll have a window that goes down really slow or maybe gets stuck on the way back up. It's pretty common. Window regulators can run you a couple hundred bucks. However, putting them in is a pain in the ass and trying to get your window realigned, take it to a professional. I, I fought with mine and gave up and now my passenger window is just slow and quite frankly, I don't care. Parts cost is a bit of a mixed bag. However, for the most part, there is the NSX tax. Simple things just cost ridiculous amounts of money. If you want a new windshield, about two grand. Blow up your motor, about 20 grand. Well, transmission, about 10 grand. Odd things like ah, like not sure what that was. Odd things like replacing this ABS pump here and putting new seals in it or swapping out, which is often a problem on early model NSXs, can easily run you two to three grand. Which is why mine's not in the car, I just deleted it, which is what most owners do. And then there's things like a basic clutch, which will easily cost you two grand just to get the parts alone. And little relays, like a blower motor relay, for example, which is just a little electronic piece that's about yay big, eh, about 300 bucks. So for the most part, trying to fix and repair and do things on these cars gets very expensive very quickly. So it's important if you're buying one to look out for one that has been well-maintained and has good service records. This car, when I bought it, was the exact opposite of all that, and I paid a lot of money for it. Another example of this is bodywork. These cars are entirely made out of aluminum, and because of that, they're incredibly expensive and very difficult to repair. This small dent on my fender that someone threw a rock at my car while I was on the freeway, even though I had a clear bra on it, it still messed up the paint, and I will probably spend anywhere from a grand to two grand just to get this simple dent fixed out of my fender. Because it's aluminum, most body shops don't even want to touch it, which is quite unfortunate because I called probably 10 of them and only two of them were even willing to attempt to fix it, which doesn't give me a lot of confidence. But just so you know, NSXs in terms of bodywork are incredibly expensive to repair, especially if they've been in a collision, if they got rear-ended or you collided with something in the front. Even if it's a very minor accident, odds are it's totaled. Honda doesn't make these body panels anymore, so Insurance companies can't buy them for body shops, which instantly totals the car anyways. But even if they could, just trying to repair an aluminum monocoque is very difficult and most shops will not tackle it. And the shops that do, it is incredibly expensive. 
and most owners say their cars never drive the same again. So luckily this one has a clean title. Other than that, there's really not much to do on these things other than drive them. That's the best thing you could do for a car is to take it out on the road and let the suspension bushings stretch and, and move and let the engine roar and give it what they call the Italian tune-up, which is where you let your motor heat up nicely and then go rev it out because that burns all the carbon deposits and things that can get in there and generally just helps the life of your engine. If I didn't believe in it, I wouldn't be redlining this thing at 200,000 miles and I have no, no problems and I daily this car every day. So I do have to depend on it. So it's very important that it stays in tip top condition. I'm kind of running through this fast because I don't want this video to get too long, but one of the most amazing things about NSXs are the resources for them. Mainly the forum nsxprime.com, which I'll link below, is fantastic. The write-ups on there, the people on there, and just the general expertise is incredible. If you wanna do anything to your car, whether it's like literally K-swap it, or fix your radio, or go into some minute aspect of how this part was engineered, I guarantee you there's an entire write-up on there. And if there's not already a write-up on there, if you post on there, I guarantee you someone will give you a wall of text in great detail describing whatever you wanna know about these cars. It's one of the most well-documented cars I've ever seen online, and that includes Miatas and Camaros, which are already very well-documented platforms, which is amazing because there's not very many of these guys out there, but the resources are enormous. There's a couple good parts companies too, mainly Science of Speed. They're out of Arizona. They're fantastic. All their stuff is machined to perfection. They're very expensive, I will say that, but they are quality. The clutch I bought from them was hmm, two grand, but it feels exactly like OEM. The slightly lightened flywheel, so it revs a little faster, so when you put the throttle, it, it's amazing. So highly recommend them. Another one is Mida. They're out of Japan. They do a lot of OEM Honda parts, and they're very reasonable as far as their prices go, but they're in Japan, so the shipping can cost quite a bit, and it takes a while to get parts. So if you do buy from them, I would buy a bunch of stuff that you need if you know that you need a bunch of parts and you're okay with waiting for them, but they are fantastic, and I haven't found anyone that can even beat their price. Same thing for S2000s. They have a ton of parts for those too. Kui Auto is another one, K-U-Y Auto. I have no clue how to pronounce it, and I'm not even gonna attempt it. They're another one, they're really great. They have a lot, of, they have a ton of NSX parts. They are very reasonably priced, and I've spoken with their customer service a couple of times, and they're super helpful at solving problems and just getting parts out in general. So, highly recommend them. Another one is oemacuraparts.com. They're pretty good too, it's just the Acura websites where you get your oil filters and stuff. They're kind of pricey, but they have stuff, so. If you can't wait for them to come from Japan, from Mida, they're pretty good too. And then other resources besides the forum that you can go on is Drift and Donuts. Yes, it's a shameless plug right there. But you can subscribe to our YouTube channel and if you have any NSX problems or questions or concerns, you can always send me a message or leave me a comment. I try to read all of them, but I can respond. I know a decent amount about these cars after having ripped it apart and spent two years obsessing over the damn thing that I could probably answer just about any question someone asked me. And if I don't, I could probably link you to the forum page that does. This next episode, I'm gonna talk about the suspension on these cars, how to make them go faster, how to make your car go faster potentially, and everything that goes into suspension tuning, the rigidity of a chassis, what kind of coilovers to buy, and all sorts of things on the next episode of Drift and Donuts. To summarize, at the end of the day, the NSX is one of the best daily cars you can have as long as you don't ever have to carry more than two people, don't live where there's a bunch of steep driveways, don't live in the snow, don't have to carry a bunch of things around with you, don't have kids.